Look with me in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's talk about blessed assurance this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, the half-brother of the Lord, then to all the apostles. At last, he appeared to me as one born out of season. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied above all people. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jumping down to verse 55, Paul says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O grave, is your sting? But thanks be to God, who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Recently in the news, there was the very strange story of two women named Jennifer Apel and Tasha Fuava. They were rescued along with their two dogs from the middle of the Pacific Ocean by a U.S. Navy cruiser. Last May, the two women set out from Honolulu bound for Tahiti on a sailboat, a trip that should have taken about two weeks, but they were missing for five months. They were finally found drifting at sea. Their boat was badly damaged. It was disabled. Their radio equipment was broken. They were fried from the Pacific sun. They were out of food and water rations. And as you can imagine, they were very, very grateful to be rescued. What makes their case so strange is that investigators later discovered that the entire time They had what's called an EPIRB device on board. EPIRB stands for Emergency Positioning Beacon Indicator Device. The entire time they had a satellite device on board that would have brought help to them immediately, but they never activated it. When investigators asked them why, they answered that they never felt like they were in a life or death situation, although they were drifting in the world's largest ocean on a disabled boat for five months. My old pastor used to say to me, there's nothing funnier than people. (laughs) You know, on this Easter Sunday morning, I find that there are actually a lot of people like Jennifer Apel and Tasha Fuava. They're drifting through life without a very clear sense of direction, badly damaged, even disabled by life's storms, unsure of their ultimate destination or when they might arrive. Meanwhile, every one of us has within us 
an EPIRB device. Everyone has within us a beacon that would bring immediate help, heavenly help. But so many people have never activated it. On Friday evening, if you were with us, we talked about the cross of Christ. We talked about the meaning of the cross and what it accomplished. This morning, I want to talk with you quickly about the resurrection of Christ. What did the resurrection accomplish? And what does it mean for us personally? We have some screens that are on their way. They're, they're, on a, they're in the Pacific Ocean on a slow boat from China. They're not here yet. They're, they won't be here for a while. And the screens really help follow through the service quite a bit, the singing and the sermon. Um, we don't have them, but we do have a handout today. Maybe you got it on your way in. And you can follow our main thoughts. You can jot them down as we go. Now, if you didn't get one of those, just say to your neighbor, oh, look, a bird, and then snag his, all right? Just grab it out of his hand. But you can follow along. As I look at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, I find four blessed assurances that the resurrection gives to us. And I want to share about them. Four blessed assurances Christ's resurrection gives to us the first one is this this is this is a open book fill in the blank pop quiz all right the first one is this if you have a pen you can write write it down Christ's resurrection assures us that our Christian faith is supernatural in nature the resurrection assures us that this faith that we have is supernatural in nature Maybe you've heard Christianity referred to as a moral philosophy. It's true that all world religions have some code of ethics that encourage us to be decent human beings. In comparison to all the other religions of the world, people have accurately noted that the ethical teachings of Jesus surpass them all. No one ever taught like Jesus. But maybe you've heard the sentiment, e even if the facts, the historical facts of the cross and the resurrection aren't true, Christianity is still the best way to live a good life. I want to tell you this morning that to that notion, Paul would say, nonsense. Nothing could be further from the truth. Beloved, listen to me this morning. Christianity only works if Christ has been crucified and buried and raised from the dead. As a moral philosophy alone, Christianity is completely bankrupt. It has absolutely nothing to offer. Christianity only works if it's supernatural. It only works if at the center of it is a crucified and a risen Savior who lives within and empowers his people to live ethically. Paul says if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then Christianity is an utter waste of time. If he hasn't been risen from the dead, Christian teachers are not worth listening to at all. They are self-deceived deceivers. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then the teachings of Christianity are empty and powerless, that they have absolutely no power to produce anything good inside of you. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, Christianity is not worth following at all. In fact, those who do are the most pitiful fools on earth, Paul says. I, hey, I didn't write it. Paul wrote it, all right? I'm just reporting to you. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then this building was an utter waste of all your sacrifices. It was a waste of 20 years of my life and Denise's life. Paul says if Christianity is not worth following, then no other religion is worth following either. We might as well go ahead and just give ourselves over to the pursuit of pleasure because that's all that life means. But, Paul says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those 
who will rise too. Beloved, listen, because Jesus has risen from the dead, it's what makes this whole thing work. Paul believed that Christ rose from the dead because he saw Jesus on the Damascus road. But how can we believe? How could the Corinthians that Paul was writing to believe? And how can we who have never seen Christ risen, how can we believe in the resurrection? Well, one way Paul says that we can be sure of the resurrection is because of the Old Testament prophecies. Paul said, this is the message I received and I pass it to you as a first, the most important thing, as a first, this is the most important thing you will hear this week. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. How can we know that the resurrection is true? It's because just as with everything else in Christ's life, it was prophesied hundreds of years before he came and he fulfilled every bit of it to a T. Some years ago, there was an MIT professor who was fascinated by the words of Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures looking for eternal life, but he said, the scriptures, they all speak about me. So this MIT professor, he, he had his math students, he gave a problem to his math students. He, he told them to calculate the probability that one man would fulfill just eight of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. What was the prob one man, what was the probability that one man would fulfill just eight prophecies? The students went to work crunching the numbers and they came back with the sum of one, of the probability of one in 10 to the 28th power. Now to help us wrap our heads around that number, imagine if you covered the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. The whole thing. You covered the entire uh, area of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep and then you put an X on one of them and buried it in the pile. And then you blindfolded a man and you told him to reach his hand in the pile and pick out the silver dollar with the X on the first try. The probability that he would pick out the silver dollar with the X on the first try is the same probability that one man would fulfill just eight of the prophecies made in the Old Testament about Messiah. Jesus fulfilled over 350 of them. <laughs> Beloved, Christianity is the only religion in the world that has the proof of fulfilled prophecy. God left markers in history so that we would recognize his son when he came and we would embrace him. How do we know that Christ's resurrection is true? How can we be sure? Another way is we can be sure by the eyewitness accounts of the New Testament. Paul says he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 at one time most of whom are still alive when Paul wrote the, the letter to the Corinthians, then to James, Jesus' half-brother, and then to the apostles. And Paul says, lastly, he appeared to me. The Gospels bear all the marks of true eyewitness testimony. For one thing, there's variety in the accounts. You know, when detectives uh, examine witnesses when they question them they look for a variety in their accounts if their stories are too closely lined up then it's usually a telltale sign of collusion it's interesting that women are listed in the gospels as the first witnesses to the resurrection in the first century women were not allowed to give testimony in court so why would the gospel writers take a risk and write that it was women who first witnessed the resurrection unless that's the way it actually went down? 
You see, these are eyewitnesses' accounts. Peter said, we didn't tell you cleverly invented stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord Jesus. He said, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. John said, we saw him with our own eyes. We heard him with our own ears. We touched him with our own hands. And we testify to you about the one who was from the beginning. How can we be sure of Christ's resurrection? Another way is by the radical change in the lives of the eyewitnesses. Other than the resurrection, grunt, what could possibly persuade a nice group of Jewish boys to believe such a blasphemous notion as a crucified Messiah? You see, at first the disciples were completely disillusioned by the crucifixion. Because the Jews believed that to die on a cross was to be cursed by God. And it was unthinkable. How could God's holy anointed one, how could God's Messiah die such a death? There were two forlorn disciples walking on the road to Emmaus and the risen Christ came up behind them. They didn't know it was Jesus risen from the dead. And they said, we thought he was the one. But then they crucified him. So we know he couldn't possibly be the one because he was crucified. And then they recognized Jesus risen from the dead and they believed. Well, what could possibly, other than the resurrection, well, what could possibly cause the disciples to begin boldly proclaiming in Jerusalem that Jesus is not only Messiah, but that he is God himself? Jesus is Lord means Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. They didn't preach that in Galilee where Jesus was wildly popular. They preached it in Jerusalem where Jesus was rejected and executed. Other than the resurrection, what could possibly cause a transformation in them that made them so fearless that they could stand in front of the Sanhedrin and the high priest and say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate who wanted to set him free. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released in his place. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this. Now listen, just a few days earlier, Peter was intimidated by a little slave girl in front of a fire. He couldn't even hold his witness for Jesus in front of a, a young teenage girl. How could he so boldly say such things to the high priest and the Sanhedrin? It's because he saw the resurrection. What could make Nice Jewish boys who were monotheists, who believed in one true God. What could make them believe in the Trinity? What could make them abandon the temple and their Jewish customs? What, what could possibly make James, the half-brother of Jesus, go from being a mocker to a believer? What could possibly make Paul, a hater of Christ and his church, become a believer himself other than the resurrection? How can we be sure of the resurrection another way? is the witness of the empty tomb. When the apostles began proclaiming in Jerusalem, Christ is risen, all the authorities had to do was present the body of Jesus. But they couldn't because the tomb was empty. You know, Jewish people then and now venerate the, the burial places of patriarchs and prophets and notable people, holy people, we can go to Hebron, we can visit the uh, burial place of the Jewish patriarchs, we can go to Jerusalem, we can visit uh, David, King David's tomb, but we can't find Jesus' tomb. That, that's proof that his tomb wasn't venerated. You know, the Catholics say it's one place, the Protestant says it's another place. Nobody really knows, and it doesn't matter because the tomb was empty. How can we be sure of Christ's resurrection? Another way is the miraculous survival of Christianity. 
To the Jews, the apostles preached a blasphemous message of a crucified Messiah. To the Greeks, they preached the laughable message of bodily resurrection. The Greeks didn't believe that the body could rise again. All the way around, the gospel was an impossible message in the first century, and it's still an impossible message today. Yet, to those who believe it, it's a message that releases the supernatural, life-changing power of God inside. 2,000 years later, Christianity is still alive and well, and crazy people like us are still building new churches. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And because he has, we don't have an empty, powerless faith. Our faith has the supernatural ability to connect us with the living God. Do you know why we built the building the way we did? Do you know why there's a great big skylight down the center of this building? It's to remind us that the cross has removed the barrier that existed between God and mankind. And we can experience a living connection with him. Mm. We don't have a faith of lofty philosophy, blah, blah, blah. We don't have a faith of mere moral codes. We don't have a faith of self-help or self-improvement. Ours is a faith of supernatural encounters. Ours is a faith infused with the resurrection life of the risen Lord. Ours is a faith of inner transformation. It's a faith of peace that remains. It's a faith of joy unspeakable and full of glory. Ours is a faith of answered prayer. Ours is a faith filled with living hope because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Four blessed assurances that Christ's resurrection gives us second Christ's resurrection assures us, if you're following along on your outline, Christ's resurrection assures us that our sins have been forgiven. Because of the resurrection, believers in Jesus have a blessed assurance that no other religion in the world has. We are assured that our sins have been blotted out, that they don't count against us. David wrote in the Psalms, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin is not counted against him. We talked about that on Friday evening. If you missed it, listen on our website to the message. You'll be blessed. The resurrection is the ultimate proof that Jesus is precisely who he said. Jesus' death assures us that he was fully human. Jesus was not just an apparition. He wasn't just a spirit that, that looked like a man. Jesus was actually a flesh and blood man. His death proves that. Jesus' burial assures us that he was fully dead. He wasn't apparently dead. He wasn't mostly dead. He was certainly dead. The Romans made sure of that. But Jesus' resurrection assures us that he was also fully divine. Peter says it was impossible for death to hold on to him because he is the author of life. The Jewish and the Roman authorities, they issued their verdict against him. They sentenced him to death on a cross, but God overturned their conviction by raising Jesus from the dead. You crucified him, Peter said, but God raised him from the dead. Paul said he was declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is proof that God accepted Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross. Paul says here, Christ died for our sins. That means he died on behalf of our sins. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I pour out my blood for the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection is how we know that that sacrifice was effective. If Christ hadn't been raised from the dead, 
the cross would have been an epic failure. It would have been for absolutely nothing. It would have accomplished nothing. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, you're still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The resurrection is God's amen to Jesus' final cry. It is finished. <laughs> Beloved, look at me this morning. They were a little sleepy. They depressed me at 9 o'clock. They were sleepy. I'm glad you're not sleepy. Look at me for a second. This is incredibly good news that cannot be found in any other religion. The resurrection assures us that our salvation doesn't depend on our own achievements, but our salvation depends upon Christ's achievement, and it is complete. It is finished. You know, I, I travel, I, I teach, I have the privilege of teaching in Bible colleges around the world and I've spent a lot of the last few years in the Far East and I've been to the temples, I've been to the Buddhist temples where people are on their knees in front of statues. They have eyes that don't see, they have ears that don't hear. They have hands that cannot reach out and help. And there are people on their knees bowing, prostrating themselves, making offerings in front of statues who can do absolutely nothing to help them. And, and, and what weary pilgrims they are. They have no certainty that, that when this life is over that something better awaits them. They worship what they don't even know. We have an assurance in Christ that belongs to no other religion in the world. No wonder Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary. Listen, if you've been trying to, to be a good person, lay down that yoke and put your trust in Jesus. Receive him by faith and let his goodness come inside of you. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Four blessed assurances. Excuse me one moment. Four blessed assurances that Christ's resurrection gives to us. Our Christian faith is supernatural in nature. Our sins have been given. Number three, Christ's resurrection assures us that our loved ones who have died in Christ are alive with Christ. Those who have gone ahead of us that believed in Jesus, they're alive with him now. Paul says death is an enemy with a terrifying sting as a young man I really didn't get it but after 25 years in ministry I sure get it now I've stood by the bedsides of young mothers who don't want to leave this earth they have young husbands they have young children and they don't want to go I think probably the worst ever was a beautiful young mother in her early 30s. She said to me, Pastor Glenn, I'm not afraid to die. She said, I, I know I'm going into the arms of Jesus. I'm not afraid. But she said, who will love my children like I love them? I want to tell you, death had a horrible sting that day. I've stood by the open graves of young fathers who left behind young wives, young widows, and, and young children with no one to provide for them, no one to protect them. Death has a horrible sting. Last couple of years, I've stood by the grave of my own father, of my beautiful mother-in-law, of my nephew. And here's what I've learned being a pastor. Doesn't matter how long someone has lived. You know, we say, oh, he had a good long life. Doesn't matter. If they lived into their 90s, glory be to God. Does, doesn't matter how much they suffered. Doesn't matter how long we've had to prepare ourselves for them to die. None of those things matter. When the time comes to say goodbye, there is a horrible sting to death. It hurts. Calls into question the meaning of life. What's the use? If we're, we're here for just such a short time and then we're gone and we're so soon forgotten, what's the point? 
Why not just enjoy ourselves? Paul says, listen to me. Paul says, if Christianity is nothing more than a moral philosophy for navigating this life, if, if Christianity is not a path to eternal life, then we are to be pitied more than anyone else. Paul said, we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. But thanks be to God. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And because he has been raised from the dead, our loved ones who have gone on ahead of us in Christ, they're with him now. I'm looking forward to seeing my Nana Walder again. She spent the last year of her life in blindness. I'm looking forward to seeing my Nana and Granddad Harvison who prayed for me and who sang songs about Jesus over me when I was a little kid. I'm looking forward to meeting Denise's mom who passed away from cancer when Denise was just 17. Never had a chance to meet her. Our daughter Maddie looks a lot like her. I can't wait to meet her someday. Denise's stepmom Maureen who was, she treated us, she was so good to Denise and I, it was like we were her own flesh and blood. She's waiting for us. I can't wait to meet Denise's great grandmother who was illiterate. She never had the privilege of an education. She could not read or write. She could not sign her name to anything, but she prayed when she became a Christian that God would give her the ability to read the Bible and she was able to read every word of the Bible and only the Bible. That's a true story. I'm looking forward to interviewing her when I get to heaven. You got some questions for God when you get to heaven? You got some things that you want to ask him? I'm, I'm accumulating a little bit of a list. God, just explain to me how that one worked. My friend Pete Ciccatelli is there. Betty Helmy is there. My friends Emil and Joanna Smriglio are there. They so wanted to see this new building. It was their prayer. They prayed to God that they would stay alive long enough to see the new building. Emil went and joined Joanna in the presence of Jesus just a year ago. But you know, before they left, they bought all the outdoor lights for this entire building because they wanted to light the way for the next generation to find Jesus. And not only will we see them then, but I believe that they see us now. I'm convinced more than ever from the scriptures of the cloud of witnesses. I'm convinced that heaven has a balcony and Emil and Joanna, they're watching us just now. They're probably saying, you're doing good, dear, but you're running a little long. Wrap it up. <laughs> oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Surely death has been swallowed up in victory. For blessed assurance from Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection finally, worship team, you can come help me. Christ's resurrection finally assures us that even if we die, we will surely rise again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me shall live even though he dies, and whoever lives by believing in me shall never die. Do you know what those last words of Jesus mean? They mean that if we are a believer in Christ, at the moment that, that we make our transition from this life to the next, the Bible says it happens like a blink of an eye. But, but if we're a believer in Jesus, Jesus said, he who lives by believing in me shall never die. Do you know what that means? It means for us as believers, when it comes, comes time for us to die, that, that we are never for one single moment without the presence of Jesus in that transition. Just like that. In a blink of an eye, we go from this world into the next world. Personally, I want to die in my sleep. I want, I, I want to lay down to, to go to bed one night and when I open my eyes, I want to say, Jesus? <laughs> Christ's resurrection assures us that we will rise too. Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And listen, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. I and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. 
Paul said, Behold, I reveal a mystery to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall be sound, shall sound, and the dead shall be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. I travel in those temples in the Far East, and those people on their knees in front of statues with no eyes and no ears and no touching hands. They have no assurance. They think that when this leg of the journey is done, they get reborn as someone or something else and they go through it all over again. Christianity gives us a hope that no other religion in the world has. And that's the hope that after this life, there will be a new me and there will be a new you. Although death is still present in our world for a little longer, Christ's resurrection has neutralized the sting of death. It's given us a certain hope that we will rise to. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Surely, death has been swallowed up in victory. So what will we do with this message of the cross? Paul says, you received this message through believing. And that's what God wants us to do with this message too. There's a moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment when God gives to your heart the gift of saving faith. It's like a spark inside of you. You might have lots of questions. There might be lots of things you don't understand yet. I've been doing this a long time and there's still lots of questions I have. But in your heart, you know that you know that you know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. Do you have that assurance this morning? Do you have that blessed assurance that your sins have been forgiven by his sacrifice and his resurrection? Have you experienced that new life inside of you? If you don't have that assurance, I want to tell you that you can before you leave this place this morning. In just one moment, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of believing. And if you'd like to, I'm going to invite you to respond to the message of Jesus' cross and his resurrection. But first, would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give a great big praise to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Oh, come on. Let's give him a good praise. Lift up your faces. Lift up your hands. Let's sing that song. Let's sing the chorus. What a beautiful name it is. Would you lift up your voice? What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name.
I find on this Easter Sunday morning that many people are like Jennifer April and Tasha Fuava, drifting through life, damaged, maybe even disabled by life's storms. But each one of us is equipped with an EPIRB device. You know what it is? It's your spirit inside of you. The Bible says that your spirit is the Lord's candle. Maybe we could say it this way. It's the Lord's emergency flare. And he's the one who sends the spark of saving faith and lights that device, that flare up. And it creates a cry out of our heart, Abba, Father. In that moment, all the help of heaven, all the help that Jesus purchased on the cross, all the help that is guaranteed us by the resurrection, it comes rushing to us. My EPIRB was set off on my bed one night when I was eight years old. I made a prayer of faith to God. I said, God, I want everything I have for you, you have for me. And in that moment, the presence of the Lord came to me and he's never left me since. I believe that perhaps this morning is the morning for someone's EPIRB device to get set off. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I'm going to lead us in a very simple prayer of believing right where you're standing. I'm not going to embarrass anybody in any way. But if there's someone here this morning and, and you'd like to respond to the message of the cross and the resurrection, you'd like to, to respond by believing, you'd like to set off that device that brings heaven's help to you. If you want to pray that prayer for the first time, while heads are bowed, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Maybe this is the first time in a long time that you've been in church. Maybe you prayed that prayer a while ago and a lot of water's gone under the bridge and you want to pray that prayer for the first time again. While heads are bowed all over this place, if, if you want to pray that prayer with me for the first time or the first time in a long time, I'm going to ask you to just lift your hand up real high so that God can see it and I can see it. If you want to pray that prayer, Oh, there's hands all over. If you want to pray that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, would you lift up your hand high so that I can see it? Come on. It's good. Lots of hands. Someone else? I want to pray that prayer. If there's someone else, I want to pray that prayer of believing. For the, there's somebody else for the first time. There's somebody else for the first time or the first time in a long time. Come on. You would just lift your hand up. This is just between you and Lord. There's someone else. Somebody else? I want to pray that prayer for the first time in a long time or for the first time. Would you all lift your hands to heaven with me and lift your faces? I'm going to lead in a prayer and I want to invite everyone who's willing if you would say this prayer believing with me. Oh, uh, hundreds of little EPIRB devices are about to go off in this place. A cry is about to emit from your spirit, Abba, Father. And heaven's help is about... Listen, for some of you standing here, Everything's going to be different after today. Today is going to set off a chain of events that's going to change everything for the good in your life. Lift up your hands, lift up your faces. If you're willing, would you say this prayer after me? I'll lead, you follow in a nice clear voice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived a perfect life for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, light my candle. Light my emergency flare. Activate my device. Send heaven's help. Forgive my sins. Make me a new person. Give me the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. 
in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on, give the Lord a really good praise.